Hi, this is David Galland. I'm here with my old friend uh, John Malden from Malden Economics. Uh, John uh, is participating in our Recovery Reality Check conference, and uh, we just thought we'd catch a few minutes and sort of get his take on the recovery and whether it's actually happening or whether it's a figment of somebody's imagination. So, John, welcome. And, and uh, well, first off, I guess the big question, the macro picture here is, are we in a sustainable recovery? No. Uh, it won't be sustainable until we figure out how to deal with the deficit. So we're in the middle of, it's just half time, uh, between the last recession and the next problem. But it can be a you know, 40 minute halftime, you know, it could be a Super Bowl halftime rather than a normal game time. It can take, it can go longer uh, than we would think. But it'll be muddled through. I mean, today we saw 2% GDP, uh, was goosed by the fact that uh, consumers saved 2% less, otherwise that it would have been uh, flat. This isn't, these aren't numbers that are being driven by increased production. Uh, it's not being driven by, um, you know, exports uh, or private uh, uh, investments. Well, it's also a large part of the GDP is government spending. It, it is, and it's becoming a larger part, and that's part of the problem because as we take government spending down, which we will be forced to do either uh, by the markets or we do it willingly. When we reduce that government spending, it will reduce GDP in the short run. I mean, it's, it boosts GDP in the short run going up, but it has the reverse effect going down. It's just like leverage can increase spending. I mean, if I go out and borrow some money and then spend it, that's good for the economy, but it, then the reality is I have to pay it back. So I've, I've spent future monies with my borrowing, and that's kind of what we've done with government spending and increasing it up to its percentage. We've borrowed from future generations, and now we're going to have to pay the piper at some point. But saying, you know, it's, it's interesting when you say that we're at sort of halftime, um, the, there's no halftime for the deficit spending. It's roaring ahead. Debts are continuing to pile up. I actually, in the news today was that uh, the House voted to not I increase student loan rates. I mean, heavens forbid, you can't do anything that's going to gore anybody's ox, but, it, but at the end of the day, you can't just keep this spending up, uh, and somebody's ox has to get gored. I mean, this is a, a true statement, right? It is, uh, but you're not going to see any ox okay. get gored by either party prior to this uh, election. But, this, you th see, but there's always an election. Won't you then see the same thing happen I even mean, after this next election? That's why I think 2013 is such a critical year. If we don't do something about our deficit and our debt in 2013, and it has to be a really significant game changer. We can't, right. we can't nibble around the edges like we've talked about right. doing. It's got to be um, a massive restructuring of our society. We don't do it in 2013. I don't see how we get to, to through uh, get it done in 2014 in an election year. I don't think we can make it to 2015 before the bond market starts to jerk our chain. Right. Um, which, which says that 2013 is the year to see something get done. Mm -hmm. If we get to this time, if we're if we're sitting at this conference in 2014 and we haven't dealt with it, uh, rather than me being the most bullish person at this conference, even though I think we've got a great deal of pain in front of us, uh, I become just as uh, bearish as Porter and Doug, well, which, uh, which would be very, very sad uh, for uh, the country. I mean, one of the things that I'm most fervent about is that I want Doug and Porter to be wrong. Yes. Well, the, the, here's the question. Every time over the last few years that the Republicans and Democrats have agreed to sit down and really get this problem fixed. Uh, they've come away with absolutely nothing. I mean, I, I forget what the, what, the, what the most expansive program they have proposed so far, but it's something to the, on the order of, what, $100 billion over 10 years, and, and it's, it's just complete nonsense. So, so to think that between now and, let's say, a year, year and a half from now, that they're actually going to have that sort of come to Jesus moment and they are gonna say, all right, now we're really gonna cut a half a trillion out of the deficit. We're gonna get on some kind of a glide path to get back to dealing with we're this. We're gonna have to cut something close to uh, eight or 900 billion. 
I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a huge number. It can't be done all in one year. It has to be done over five or six years. We have to have some growth that'll do it as well. Um, well, if you start talking 150 billion a year, you're talking 1% of GDP, that we're gonna reduce GDP, and it'll have an effect for about a year. And then we're gonna do it again. So th what we've done is we've locked in slow growth. We've locked in a muddle through economy, right. and that's without a recession. Uh, if we have a recession, it makes the situation worse. We will have a recession during that period. It's just, you don't go for 10 years without a recession. Uh, it is problematical. If we don't do it, we get to the place where uh, Greece was, or Spain is, where Italy is, where your, the markets will begin to force you to do it. Uh, Spain would be in a, in a catastrophic situation if it was not for the fact uh, that the ECB put, you know, one point something trillion euros right. together. And without them, without uh, Europe, ECB slash somebody putting another trillion euros together, Spain will, in fact, uh, have their own uh, moment where they can no longer borrow money at rational numbers. Uh, the interest rates go hyperbolic on them, and they start having to talk default. Well, it was interesting that Lacey Hutt, who was the former chief economist of the Dallas Fed, I believe, was saying that uh, he didn't, that the Fed doesn't control interest rates, which is on the long side, as we know is true. Mm -hmm. However, when they make a promise that they are gonna maintain current low rates through 2014, there's really only one way they can do that, if I'm correct, which is to actually go into the treasury markets and and if there isn't a sufficient demand to, to buy the buy the treasuries, they've got to step up to the plate and create the money if that's what's required, and buy the treasuries. So in fact, they do at this point have still some way to exercise control over long rates. They've moved out to uh, the yield curve, uh, mm -hmm. five, seven, in some case ten, uh, to bring those rates down. Right. That shouldn't surprise us because that was precisely what Bernanke said he would do in 2002 when he gave his famous helicopter speech, right. uh, which I'm sure he regrets now using the helicopter analogy. That was supposed to be an economist joke. It right. was told to an association of economists, right. and I'm sure the economists laughed because it was kind of an inside chuckle, right. but the rest of the world didn't get the joke. Right. Um, but the, the more important thing uh, than his helicopter dropping cash part was he said, we'll move out the yield curve if we have to do, because he's a Keynesian. Right. And at their heart, they believe that it's final demand, that it's consumer spending that drives the economy. Now, a good Austrian like yourself, uh, um, and, or a quasi-Austrian like me, would say, no, it's, it's productivity and supply. It's the, it's the creating creation of uh, lower priced goods that will it create the demand itself. So you have to have that first. Right. Um, so I mean it, it's an opposite perspective. Right now the Keynesians uh, have the reigning paradigm in uh, the entire developed world um, and most of the emerging market worlds and until that thought process is destroyed which they're in the process of doing that in, in Europe. Right. Uh, that experiment is beginning to show itself as not working. Um, Except for the French have just, it looks like they're gonna elect the uh, socialists to. Well, yeah, but then, then that makes France uh, my candidate, uh, which I've been talking about for some time, uh, for the next really big black swan. Right, right now, nobody's talking about France being a problem on the scale of Spain or Italy. Right. And I would suggest that they won't be a problem on the scale of uh, Spain or Italy. It'll be Spain and Italy together and doubled. Right. Spain will be, I mean, France will be uh, the final uh, uh, negative outcome, the final nail in the coffin, however you want to call it, uh, to Europe. And uh, Holland only makes it uh, more likely that it will happen. Uh, <clears throat> it, 
you would like to think that, that the French could have, you know, wake up when they walk into the polls and go, oh my God, we really can't put this crazy man in. When you look at what he's saying, it's totally right. absurd. Right. Um, and they're already careening dangerously close to the edge of the cliff. But if they do, then they just get further down the road. I mean, right. fr France has got some real problems. Right. The, I mean, one of the things that <clears throat> is so interesting in all of this, <coughs> and it, it really does beg the question, and again, Lacey on a lot of the traditional economists, you know, they have, they view By the way, Lacey's not a traditional well, economist. Well, okay, okay, okay. But you've got to be careful. He's, he's, he's well-schooled in, in, oh, in, in, he, in, in he, matters he's of- He's an educated economist. He's a very, he's very educated, yes. But it, from my perspective, it seems that the, the there's a lot of people main, more mainstream, let's say, than some of the stuff we do at Casey Research, who are you know, they have an opinion. They view this through the lens of sort of history, and here's how these things ought to work, mm -hmm. and and where they should go. But it seems that the to me that the backup in terms of the years and years of the sort of the dead wood. Uh, building up or laying on the ground of, of socialism, if you will, uh, of where people have come to expect the government, they've been educated to expect the government to fix everything. Uh, whenever there's a problem, the first thing they do is they hold uh, con congressional committees. I mean, my God, they're still chasing after I think it's Roger Clemens over us. <laughs> Did he <laughs> use steroids or not? I mean, you know, because, you know, baseball players have to have a level field, so let's get the government, they can fix that too. So you've got this thing, and again, Europe is, or France is a very good example. You have a, you have a scenario where the French people, they're tired of this crisis, they're tired of the problems, they're tired of the unemployment, they're tired of everything that's going on, and they want the government to fix it, damn it. And so their solution to that is, okay, the other guys didn't fix it, the, the, the right-wing guy didn't fix it, let's bring in the socialists now, now they're gonna fix it. But the way they're gonna fix it is by getting you know, chickens in every pot and, and, and all of this stuff. But in reality, they don't have any money, they're broke. Uh, all these big Western economies are broke. So it's, it's looking from a, I call it a less traditional perspective, it seems to me that your word endgame is a very, uh, your, your phrase endgame is a very good phrase because it seems like this has got to come to an end, but it can't be a soft and fuzzy end because people don't want, people want immediate satisfaction and it's understandable. If you don't have any savings in the bank and if you're, you're living, uh, you know, hand to mouth and uh, you know, you, you could lose your house, or you've lost your job, and you can't find a new one, which is, applies to an awful lot of people. You want a solution, you want it now. You're not going to wait five years down the road for that chicken in the pot. So there's, there, there, there's a good chance, it seems to me, that the, pu the public are going to lose patience with this, are losing patience, but the solutions that they're going to want to see uh, are not the solutions that would actually fix the problem, which would, to say, going back to freer markets, to lowering taxes, uh, even on the wealthy, or uh, reducing regulations, reducing the amount of services the government provides. It seems like that's a, that's a complete opposite of what people would actually politically accept. I mean, what's your general view on that? Greece is a good example, and they're, they're the easy example. Greece has a choice between the disaster of staying in the Euro or the equally bad but different disaster of leaving the Euro. They only have a choice of dis which disaster they want to choose. One is a, a long, slow disaster, staying in the euro, because their wages have to equalize. Uh, that's a depression for another five to ten years. Uh, leaving the euro, going to the drachma, would be a deep and quick recession. Um, if they try to recover uh, when they, if they went into drug and tried to recover with the same set of rules they have now, uh, it'll halt and, and uh, uh, make their recovery much more difficult. Mm -hmm. You've really got to uh, hit the reset button on not just the currency, but on a whole host of things. Uh, so this isn't I, true just of Greece, this is actually... Well, it is, it's, it's now becoming mm -hmm. Spain without the European Central Bank uh, uh, being willing to put in another trillion dollars and hold those uh, uh, interest rates down. Spain has the same problem. Spain becomes Greece. Right. Um, Europe has got to spend trillions of euros to give their governments the time uh, that are uh, Spain, Italy, Ireland, Portugal. Um, 
but, but, even, but, even, but, even Holland, but, to, to be able to, to, to be able to reduce their deficits and, and get their 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 balances into a primary surplus, without concerted monetary printing, that can't happen. But don't stop at Europe. You also get Japan. You well, Japan. I mean, <laughs> I'm well known about my bearish views on right, Japan. Right. So, so you have. So basically, this is really is a global phenomenon. It is a global phenomenon of the developed world. The the, the good the good news, um, if you're Brazil, mm -hmm. was that nobody would lend you money at a reasonable rate, so you didn't get in debt. Right. You know, uh, there's a lot of countries that aren't in debt, and they're going to be able to just chug right along. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, and it's not like the United States or, or Europe is going to go away. Right. The, the, what I was trying to kind of semi-tongue-in-cheek today was talking about how bullish I am because we're uh, coming to the end of the ability of governments to borrow money. We're going to stop misallocating capital government uh, uh, spending and we're going to start allocating it properly to productive resources. Well, now that transition is very difficult. It's either very bumpy and it's a slow muddled through grind or it's a crisis here in the U.S. But either way, when you get to the other side of it, and I don't think, I don't think it's going to take more than about five years. One way or another, we're, going, we're through this right. by the, the, the you know, latter half of this decade. Then it becomes quite bullish right. uh, because we then can have some certainty. We've restructured, we've rationalized the debt in one form or another. Uh, and we can start um, uh, moving forward. But the, the ride between here and there, the difficulty for investors is that we have to make sure we get as much as our capital that we have today, as much as our earning power that we have today, to the end of this process. Right. And the best way to do that? Um, we don't know, and probably won't know for another 15 to 18 months. The best thing to do now is to hedge your bets uh, I mean, diversify. Right. I want. Uh, I want income. Right. I want. Uh, right. I, I, I want to be able to make as much money on my assets as as I can. But I don't want to have to commit uh, to a, a five or ten year process. If I want to own real estate, if I could buy distressed real estate that will produce income, that I can uh, be reasonably sure there will be people who will. Uh, at least this ring to say either business or uh, uh, individuals. Um, that's a, a productive in, uh, asset. And so that if we have a, um, you know, an inflationary episode, which I think is the pro more probable scenario, not the hyperinflation that, that Porter's talking about, but inflationary. Uh, that's a good, real estate will be a good asset to own is if you right. bought it at, uh, you know, distress prices today. Right. Uh, even if Lacey's right, we see a, a true deflation, which is hard for me to see where we get long term that way. I could certainly right. see that in the sh short three to five year term span. Right. Um, you've still got a productive asset. The I want to own companies that are producing things that people want to buy. Right. Um, I'm technology, the advance of technology is not going to slow down. Right. There's places to put money to work. So there's opportunities that we have to get our money from A to B to C. Right. Uh, but the traditional index funds, right. the traditional things that people have most of their pensions and their uh, in, uh, savings in is not where you want to be. Yeah, no, there's a huge amount of money that, of course, has gone into bond funds in recent years, and that's probably getting a little bit long. Yep. That trade's probably getting a bit long. So. All right, well, I think that's a, a good place to leave it, and thank you, and we could probably just sit here and do this all day. So, <laughs> Well, let's do it again. We shall do it again. Thank you for coming to the conference. And thank you.